Hi, Brian. Thank you very much for coming here. So what is the stage with the vaccination for cows? They don't do it because it's not economically feasible or it's the research on it is inconclusive and might be dangerous to humans? The question is, why don't we vaccinate cows right now? It's quite complex. Um, one of the reasons that's been given is the fact that you cannot distinguish between a vaccinated cow and a, vac and a cow which actually has the disease. And so you need a test to discriminate between the two. Now this test has been developed now. It's called the DIVA test. It's discriminating between infected and vaccinated animals. It's there, it's been tested. It needs to be licensed, but it's proved. Um, so one of the reasons that Europe has been reluctant to allow us to vaccinate is because of this. But the DIVA test is now there. There are a number of runs that have to be done. There are various boards that have to be satisfied. But underlying all this, there is a fear among the, uh, the economic farming community that vaccinating our cows is some kind of admission that we are riddled with bovine TB and the people that we export cows to um, will stop dealing with us, which is a, it's a strange way of thinking, but I think it's been deeply ingrained for a long time. There are uh, problems. You have to prove it. It's a little bit of a catch-22 situation. In order to prove that the vaccine works in cows, although we kind of know it will because it works in humans, but what you have to do is mount a test. At the moment, Europe does not want us to mount a test because it means um, putting a cow... Well, basically, they won't buy those cows from us because they're, they're under test. And so it's very hard to find a situation where you can isolate... Uh, one particular area, do your, your test on cows, and, and have another co a, a control group somewhere else. What they have done is do tests in Ethiopia, uh, where the, the incidence of bovine TB is very high, and the results have been very good. So the government are telling us that they are committed to vaccination of cows, but it's going to be years and years and years. It might be. I personally don't believe that it needs to be that long. And I've had expert advice from that direct from Brussels. I believe if we get on with trying to vaccinate, first of all, the badgers, and secondly, the cows, that we could get this underway in a couple of years. And this would be the turning point because vaccination is the way that you get immunity, herd immunity in populations. It worked for humans, it should work for cows. Hi, Brian, thanks a lot for your words. Um, how far would you blame the media and like newspapers and things for creating the misinformation and the situation against badgers that you've described or do you think the government has more to answer for or even farmers themselves? I mean, I'm just interested where the blame lies. Hmm. It's a very interesting question. There's a whole network, of course, which is connected and uh, a lot of the newspapers, well, the paper we call the Tory Graph, is very much connected with the government, you know, and becomes almost an, an organ of the government. Uh, the government also has fiercely strong connections with the farming community because the farming community helped to put this government into place. Now, without getting into what you might describe as um, alarmism or conspiracy theories, the truth is that uh, a deal was done during the last elections for this um, organisation called Vote OK to support certain people who, strange enough, had to be Tories, um, to support the repeal of fox hunting. Now, fox hunting, you would think, had nothing to do with this whatsoever, but strange enough, it is all linked. Um, so a lot of these people were put into place. Vote OK was begun by a chap who's very high up in the NFU, farming union. So the government, many, many of the people who are actually in government would be accurate in saying that they owe a lot to people who are connected with the NFU and connected with fox hunting for their current position. Therefore, it's very hard for them to go against them. A lot of the media are in cahoots as well, so you have this whole network. And we are pretty powerless. You know, it's, unfortunately, those of us who try to keep an open mind and try to speak up for, for wild animals particularly, find that we have no cards left at our disposal. The government, the NFU, and the newspapers and the media are holding all the Trump cards. Uh, nevertheless, things do change. 
I think if anyone had looked at uh, Wilberforce and his fight against slavery, he was up against very similar odds. The, the odds were totally stacked against him, but he won through. Even simple things, like a few years ago, a lot of us would have said it's impossible to stop um, people smoking in, in public places because there was so much, uh, this, this network of intrigue surrounded that. Nevertheless, it happened. And I believe that if enough people become educated to what's really going on in this country, um, and I'm not speaking politically here, I've mentioned the word Tory, but basically we have friends in all parties, and that's very, very important to me. Um, I believe that animal welfare and decency should be above politics, and that's what I would like to see happen in this country. And I believe that we can change things. I believe that, uh, that things will change and we will ad adapt our position towards animals. Hi, Brian. Thanks a lot for your words. Um, how far would you blame the media and like newspapers and things for creating the misinformation and the situation against badgers that you've described? Or do you think the government has more to answer for, or even farmers themselves? I mean, I'm just interested where the blame lies. Hmm. It's a very interesting question. There's a whole network, of course, which is connected, and uh, a lot of the newspapers, well, the paper we call the Tory Graph, is very much connected with the government, you know, and becomes almost an, an organ of the government. Uh, the government also has fiercely strong connections with the farming community because the farming community helped to put this government into place. Now, without getting into what you might describe as um, alarmism or conspiracy theories, the truth is that uh, a deal was done during the last elections for this um, organisation called Vote OK to support certain people who, strange enough, had to be Tories, um, to support the repeal of fox hunting. Now, fox hunting, you would think, had nothing to do with this whatsoever, but strange enough, it is all linked. Um, so a lot of these people were put into place. Vote OK was begun by a chap who's very high up in the NFU, farming union. So the government, many, many of the people who are actually in government would be accurate in saying that they owe a lot to people who are connected with the NFU and connected with fox hunting for their current position. Therefore, it's very hard for them to go against them. A lot of the media are in cahoots as well, so you have this whole network. And we are pretty powerless. You know, it's, unfortunately, those of us who try to keep an open mind and try to speak up for, for wild animals particularly, find that we have no cards left at our disposal. The government, the NFU, and the newspapers and the media are holding all the Trump cards. Uh, nevertheless, things do change. I think if anyone had looked at uh, Wilberforce and his fight against slavery, he was up against very similar odds. The, the odds were totally stacked against him, but he won through. Even simple things, like a few years ago, a lot of us would have said it's impossible to stop um, people smoking in, in public places because there was so much, uh, this, this network of intrigue surrounded that. Nevertheless, it happened. And I believe that if enough people become educated to what's really going on in this country, um, and I'm not speaking politically here, I've mentioned the word Tory, but basically we have friends in all parties, and that's very, very important to me. Um, I believe that animal welfare and decency should be above politics. And that's what I would like to see happen in this country. And I believe that we can change things. I believe that, uh, that things will change and we will ad adapt our position towards animals. Uh, thank you very much, Brian, for a, a great talk. And, and on a personal note, thank you very much for some great music over the years. Um, thank you. <laughs> I, I sort of want to ask a question about uh, sort of what's on your wish list. There, there seems to be lots of other uh, campaigns uh, that where there's a, uh, sorry, I should stand. That'd be better. Where there's there's uh, some either a body of of scientific evidence or a lack of evidence against it. Thinking things like the fisheries, where there's lots of evidence to say we're overfishing, but there's no mechanism to sort of force the government's hands to say we're going to make policy decisions based upon scientific evidence. And yet they'll use scientific evidence when it suits them for things like the foot and mouth coal. So what's your idea, what's your dream little mechanism to be able to go to the Office of the Chief Scientific Advisor or whoever, 
to say, no, no, we need to have some sort of motion that means we're going to make a, a more informed decision about this, not just a political decision about this. Very interesting question. I think my dream is that a structure could be put in place which would ensure that decisions were not just made because of economics or for political gain. Um, and that's a long job, probably. I mean, I, it's strange to me that we have a minister for hunting and yet we don't have a minister for wild animals. You know, to me, we should have a minister for wild animals. And you brought up the fisheries. It's a very good point. I mean, it's, it, to me, plainly, ethically, we shouldn't have wiped out the cod in our vicinity. It's, it's kind of a no-brainer, but the only way you can persuade people to change their policy as regards overfishing cod is to tell them that there won't be any cod for them soon, you know, and, and to tell people they won't be able to make any money out of it. So I find a lot of my time, no matter which issue we're talking about, it, and it can be lions, you know, it can be tigers, it can be rhinoceros, you can ethically talk all day, talk yourself blue in the face. The only time you will make any impression is when you persuade someone that they'll be able to make some money out of, of changing the way they, they see things. Um, so it's kind of depressing. I would like to see an altruism in politics. I would like to see people making decisions for the good of the planet, for the good of all species on the planet. I mean, it's hard enough even to find people who make decisions uh, to be fair to humans. So obviously it's damn hard to find people who will make decisions that are, that are good for other species as well. I would like to see that happen. Um, what's happened to me in the last couple of years is that I spent a lot of time in, in the House of Commons. I think they're going to get me a bed there soon, actually. Um, and, and what I discovered is actually pretty disappointing. A large percentage of MPs are there because it's a career and they can further themselves. And if they have a point uh, of principle which they want to stick by, they will get someone knocking on their door and saying, yes, yes, you can vote against the Prime Minister on this, but of course there is this job coming up next month and of course you won't get considered that. You know, and, uh, uh, you know, and, and uh, all these little subtle pressures can be brought to bear. So the politicians end up making compromises. I'm happy to say I know some great politicians now in all parties, people who will stand up for their, for their beliefs. And that's what we need. For, in some way, I don't know how to do it, but somehow we need to change the system so that people survive in politics on the basis of speaking the truth. It's going to be hard. <laughs>